by Mike the Big Cheese. Welcome back to the Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show. It is Sunday, August 27th. We're wrapping up another month in the year of 2023. 
Man, next month is September. I can't believe it. We don't have a show next Sunday. Uh, it's Labor Day weekend over here. Uh, so we're going to take the weekend off and recuperate. We had a really busy summer. We've had two to three guests on every week. And most of them, if not all of them, are pretty much live on the air when we were doing the show. So uh, we're going to take a weekend off. And we're going to come back with our 15-year anniversary show. And we got a great one for everybody. Adrian Vandenberg will be our guest. Udo Dirk Schneider. And I believe Phil Campbell will also be calling in that night. So... We're bringing out all the big guns for the anniversary show. But tonight we got another great one for you. Wayne Noon and Alex Rapetti from Seven Angels will be calling in first in about a half hour. And then the man himself, John Gallagher of Raven, in the second half of the show. I think it was less than a year ago that we spoke with John when the compilation record came out. Uh, but we're going to do it all over again tonight because I got another one out that's phenomenal. All hell's breaking loose. Right there, Clovenhoff, classic Clovenhoff off their first record from 1984. An album that came out on Neat Records, a great label from the New Wave of British Heavy Metal era. That's when the band was known as Water, Fire, Air and Earth. Water, Dave Potter, we had him on the show, we didn't have him on the show, we played one of his bands on the show last week, uh, a group that he was called H-Bomb, for a very short amount of time, they were a French band, pretty good, I mean, you know, I really liked the earlier stuff without him in there more, but the album that he did put out with them wasn't so bad, and, you know, Lee Payne is a good friend of mine, he's on the show a lot, and when he reached out to me a few months back, you know, when everything happened, and George Cole was out of the band, it's actually longer than that now, but, uh, when all that went down, he sent me a message saying that, you know, uh, Harry Conklin, the tyrant, is going to be singing with the band. You know, so he posted about it, and I posted about it, and I guess it didn't sit too well with the rest of the guys in the band, and Jack Pans, and maybe they didn't know about it, he didn't mention it to them. Uh, but they kind of, you know, Harry kind of released things saying, well, he was just asked to be a guest vocalist on his record, and he was helping out a friend and filling in. But when we had Harry on the show about a month ago, and I had brought up the whole Clovenhoff thing to him, he's like, yeah, we're getting ready to start recording that record. And I said, is this going to be like a permanent thing? He goes, I hope so. I really would like to do it. So, I don't know, a lot of mixed messages there. Is Harry going to be a part of the band permanently? He's never going to leave Jack Pans. I mean, he's been out and out. He's been in and out of band quite a few times over the last four decades. But at this point in their career, that's not going to happen. He'll always be the singer for Jack Pans. But if he does a Clovenhoff thing, I really like to see what it sounds like when Harry's singing it because he has a very distinctive voice and it's kind of very defined to Jack Panza and quite a few other bands that he's in. So let's see what happens. You never know. Okay, let's get back to the music. We got to get some songs on before our first guest comes on. How about we do a little damage? It's been quite a while since I've played damage on the show. Let's get a March of the Gladiators.
out to Mark Johnson, my God, when I first started doing this show about 15 years ago about coming on, and we went back and forth for about two years trying to make it happen, it just never did. Uh, he's a teacher in Boston, so uh, very busy during the year, and in the summer he does a lot of traveling. Uh, but they were a great band, I liked them. Two records out in 86 and 87, that came off of In the Name of Evil, the debut record, and then there was Break the Silence that came out in 1987. I know uh, sometime in the 90s there was a, a compilation album put out, I just can't remember the name of it. But it featured a lot of songs that were never released by the band and stuff that was recorded after the Break the Silence record. And I think in 2013, Old Metal Records had re-released the first two albums. It wasn't the greatest re-release job, so I think it's due for a new one. And I'm going to try to get Mark on here one more time. Maybe he doesn't want his students knowing he was in a heavy metal band in the 80s. I don't know, but they were great. And right before that, Shock Paris. Uh, I know they put out a few new songs. I want to say about a year ago. I don't think I ever played any of them on the show. Uh, the production of it wasn't exactly the best. 
Uh, so I don't know if they will like rehearsal tracks or like demo cuts of some new music. We'll find out. I'll reach out to Vic, see if he wants to come on again here too. And we'll find out all about that. All right, our first guest will be calling in in about 10 minutes. Uh, I just wanted to mention, somebody had emailed me the other day saying that like one or two of the last couple of shows weren't on YouTube. Uh, and just so you know, I don't upload anything to YouTube. I don't use YouTube for the show or anything else. I don't promote it. I mean, there is a page up there because Spreaker, who hosts my show, the live show for Sunday, automatically uploads the show to, to, to YouTube for me. Uh, sometimes they get like these, you know, strikes against them for uh, copyright things. They don't upload it. I don't know. Like I said, I really don't bother with YouTube. I, I know some people listen to it on there. I guess there's a couple of listeners of my shows. Uh, but uh, really, come here to Spreaker.com or any other platforms after this. iTunes, Pandora, iHeartRadio. It's on Amazon. You know, you can listen to it anywhere you want. Also on my, my Heavy, Metal Mayhem, Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show.com website. And on the blog, you can listen to it over there also. So don't use YouTube. I don't know why anybody even goes there, to be honest with you. Yeah. All right, how about we do our, uh, let me see, we got about 10 minutes left. We could do our demolition segment. I also wanted to try Lizzie Borden released a new single. Now, I love old school Lizzie Borden. Such a big fan of that stuff. Lizzie's been on the show a few times. I think the last time I interviewed him was when the last record came out. He was in New York doing press, and uh, we met up in his hotel. It was like right up, it was a hotel right above where he used to do the late show with David Letterman. And, you know, you go into his room, and it's this tiny little, like, you know, Manhattan hotel room, and he's sitting in the corner in a chair like the Godfather. All the lights are dim. He's got one little lamp on in the corner and dark sunglasses on. And I'm like, meanwhile, it's like 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> if I remember, it was like a late night interview. The room was pitch black and he's wearing sunglasses. But Lizzie is a super nice guy. He really is. Love talking to him. Uh, when Midnight Things came out and we spoke, we did that interview. Uh, he was very disappointed with Appointment with Death. And that's why there was such a gap in between that record and my Midnight Things. But he released a new single called Death of Me. And, I mean, I just cannot get into this. I mean, I'm hoping that the rest of the record is different, but I doubt it. It's probably all going to be in this vein, in my opinion. It sounds like Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails and uh, Three Doors Down, all that kind of shit like that. I mean, even that stuff's not popular anymore, so I don't know why he kind of did this. Uh, I don't even know if I can make it through the whole song, so I'll just play a little bit of it. And then we'll do our demolition segment right after that. But let me know what you think. This is brand new Lizzie Border called Death of Me. Okay, that's about all I can listen to of that. Like I said, he's such a great guy, Liz, and I love talking with him, but this is pretty bad shit. I mean, you know, like I said, the music that he's trying to emulate is not even popular anymore, so maybe he should kind of put out more than like 10 years apart and get his finger on the pulse of what's happened, or maybe just keep putting out, you know, Lizzie Borden, Lizzie Borden music. I don't know what to say. It's just, it's just horrible in my opinion. All right, let's do our demolition segment. Then we're going to get to the guys from Seven Angel in a few minutes. Uh, this is a band called Crisis out of Utah. This comes off their first demo tape from 1983 called Crank It Up. They were a really good band. I mean, I have reached out to them a couple of times. I never got a response. I'm going to try one more time. It has been probably a decade since I last tried to you know, make it happen. But like I said, they were out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Not exactly the capital of heavy metal back in the day. But they were around since like 79 and then went through a lot of incarnations. They were Rough Night in 
the mid nineties, then four forty, then hard bargain. Then I think they went back to crisis again. I'm not really sure, but they had a couple of good records out. Well, really one one good record out in an EP called Arm to the Teeth, uh, before kind of breaking up in the mid nineties. But this is off their first demo, the title track of the demo. It's called Crank It Up. <laughs>
right, there you go, Crisis of the first demo from 1983. Uh, if you need a copy of it, just uh, message me, email me, I'll send it to you. They were a pretty good band, like I said, you know, Mormon metal, you can't beat that, right? <laughs> we had Madeline Michelle on a few weeks ago, and, uh, you know, she's from the same area. She says the scene today is much better, which is good. Okay, we're going to wait a minute or two. Wayne's in the chat room, actually, our next guest, so uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes for him to call in. We'll get this interview going before we move on to the next guest, which is John Gallagher of Raven. Uh, John's over in Europe right now. Uh, hang on. Let me get Wayne on the line. Let me connect him. Wayne, it's Mike. How are you, my friend? Hey, what's going on, Mike? Hey, it's good to talk to you. I'm happy that you guys are out there making music because, you know, I go back with you a couple of years to the Phoenix Rain days, so I was happy when you put the Seven Angels together. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow, that's cool. Destination I'm Unknown so is really people, correct. Uh, wow, that's pretty cool. I'm so surprised when people mention that band. You know, it's been so long ago, so it's pretty cool that uh, people actually still remember that. Oh, we remember. Oh, hang on a second. It was Alex Colin and also, I believe, right? Yeah, Alex, Alex was calling too. I yeah. think we got him on the other line. Let's get everybody here together. Alex, you're on the air? Alex, are you there? Hey. How you doing, Alex? Good, how are you? I'm doing great. Wayne's also on the line. I'm not good with technology, so when I can connect three people together, it's a good day for me. <laughs> Yeah, man, man, what was with that Lizzie Borden song? <laughs> I, I don't know, man. That was horrible. I, I mean, I don't know. He's trying to redefine a genre that I think kind of died out quite a while ago. Oh God, yeah, I, I know. It's weird. I'm, I'm a huge Lizzie Borden fan too, and you know, I, I listened to that song the other day when when they first put it out, and I was just like, I can't listen to more than like two seconds of this. It's it's just not. I don't know. It's weird, and I understand he's trying to stay you know, up his game a little bit because he does that in every album. He doesn't always sound the same, but just, I don't know. I don't, it, it, I think you like, like you said, it's just that stuff is already done and, and over with. So I don't know what he's doing. Exactly. If you're going to reinvent something, just don't reinvent something that's already invented. That's the whole thing. But he, yeah, he's such yeah. a super nice guy too. So I hate to talk bad right, or talk right. shit about it, but you got to just say it as it is. And you know that, I mean, you know, you have Rat Salad review, you know, you go through this with all the yeah. bands and reviews. So you know exactly what, you know, what it's like. Oh, of course. Of course. You know, it's, it's, uh, Yes, I get it. <laughs> I hear you. Well, I'm just going to throw the questions out there, and whoever wants to jump in can jump in. I know we can't see each other, so it makes it a little harder, but I'll try to call individuals yeah. out to answer the questions. But for most people, I mean, you know, you guys have been around for quite a long time doing this in, in multiple different bands, and this band's been going on for almost, what, two years now? Um, Actually, only a year. Really? Is that... Yeah, a little over a year. Wow. Man, I guess a little over a year. Yeah. You've accomplished a lot in a year's time. Yeah, uh, we you. haven't stopped. We started, uh, you know, uh, when we did, and, and then we just we keep going. We actually just finished, or almost finished, with album three already. So we're just continuing almost. to, yeah, almost, uh, continuing just to write music because we really don't play shows too much or, or really at all right now. So we rather just stay productive and, and get some uh, music out there as much as we can. Oh, that's good to know. Alex, is it important to keep playing shows, or really is the focus on just a studio? I mean, or do you, do you have, kind of have to do a little bit of both? I mean, we would love to do shows, but um, just due to logistical reasons, um, we're we're leaning more towards the writing and you know recording and just uh, putting out studio albums. I hear that. Well, the bands were mostly in New York and 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 in Pennsylvania between the two between all the guys. Yeah. 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 I mean, does that make it difficult? I mean, I know getting together on a regular basis, you know, nobody wants to travel three hours, you know, to go to a rehearsal studio, but there are other ways you could do it today <laughs> with technology and stuff. Yeah. I mean, we tried. We had, did actually have two practices uh, not too long ago, but uh, everybody's got different work hours, and it's just really hard to get everybody in one room all at the same time, and it's just, uh, it's been hard. But, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to try again because we do want to do some uh, recordings of videos and stuff for the next album that we have. And, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to v- together at some point, maybe to practice some of the newer stuff, too, to hopefully uh, get ready for a show if we ever get to have one. But, um, yeah, it's just we got to just get everybody's time schedules together. It's hard. Life gets in everybody's way. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's a crazy world we live in. Well, you know, like I said, the band started a little over a year ago. Uh, I know, like, you know, you released a whole bunch of singles to start things out. I think there were, like, maybe seven or eight singles that came out over the course of last year. Was that the game plan, like, to, you know, like, kind of test the waters with each one to see how people are going to react to it? Yeah, I'll let Alex answer that one. Well, um, we actually wrote the album first. But then while we were shopping it around and trying to figure out what to do with it, we figured, well, you know, we're 
you know, we banged through the album in like three months. So we figured, you know, let's just keep writing and see what happens. And we had, you know, maybe like half a dozen songs and we decided, well, you know what, while we're waiting to see what we do with the album, why don't we just start putting singles out so people can at least hear what we're about. And, and yeah, so kind of what you said, you know, just kind of see how people react. You know, most bands wouldn't release that many singles instead of putting out a record uh, because they feel like they're, using, they're going through the catalog. But you guys talking about being on your mm-hmm. third record, like as far as songwriting goes, writing songs is not a difficult process for you guys. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know what it is? It's the, it's the ease of being able to record from home. And we don't do any shows, so it's just easy just that we're home. We got ideas going on in our heads, and we just get them done. You know, it's, it's, it's actually very easy. It's easier than going to the studio. I remember going to the studio, and, and like you mentioned, in my Phoenix Rain days, and every week, you know, we would, we would maybe have one song, you know, at, at a practice, you know, and sometimes we might not even have a song at a practice. So I think working from home and doing everything on the computer, it's just so much easier, and, and everybody just throws their ideas, and it just, it just happens like, you know, within a week or so we have a song, and it, it's pretty crazy. Do you think it's better when bands don't get together too often because it kind of keeps the peace amongst the uh, members? I, I, I think so, because Alex bothers me a lot. He's just, you know, he gets on my nerves a lot. Lou, Lou, Lou's another story. But no, I, I actually, we all have fun. We uh, When we did hang out uh, for that studio practice that we did, uh, we have a lot of fun with each other. So we, we all get uh, along really well. That's important. Well, sometimes I mean, it might help. Maybe if, if we did hang around more, maybe we would get sick of each other. But we talk on Messenger almost every single day, so it's like, kind of like we're always seeing each other. So I don't know. Now, you would definitely get sick of each other. My wife tells me that every day after 30 something years. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry. But, but how did all you guys meet? Were you familiar with each other before the band started? Were you all new to each other when you got together? Uh, some of us knew each other. Uh, it, it pretty much started from my, my podcast, Rat Sound Review. <clears throat> and um, we were doing cover songs. Uh, I was doing them with uh, my co host, Lou Mav. And I said, let's, because um, he's, he's been in cover bands, he knew me from uh, back in Phoenix Rain. So um, I, we always wanted to do a band together, and we just never got to do it. So I said, you know, we're doing these cover songs, and I, we already got George, the bass player. He was in a band called Timeless Haunt. And um, I, I said, let's, you know, let's do a real band. Let's make cover, uh, not cover songs, original songs. And I know Alex, because Alex mixed my other band, Project Resurrect. He mixed the album for that. And um, he started singing uh, one of uh, his own uh, solo tracks one day, and I really enjoyed what he did. And the keyboard player, I knew he was actually um, works with my uh, father-in-law. And uh, he said, I know this guy that likes metal and all the stuff, the same stuff that you listen to, check him out. And he's been on my show a few times. So I knew he wanted to do a band. So I just asked everybody if they wanted to do like real original music. And everybody was into it. So it just started right from there. And it was like almost immediately, as soon as I, I said something, everybody was ready to go. That's great. You know, doing covers is one thing, but then like you come up with the idea of doing an original band and putting it together. Where does the music come from? Where does it blossom from? Where do you say, hey, here's what we should sound like, or this is the direction we want the band to go in? Was everybody, I mean, it's hard to describe the band's music because it has that European symphonic sound, yet it has classic power metal to it. There's a little bit of everything going on. So how do you come up with the sound the design and the style of the band from the beginning? I'll let Alex answer that because he's the engineer. So go ahead, Alex. Oh, well, I mean, in terms of the music writing, um, we never really had that conversation. We just kind of started writing and it all happened very organically in terms of like producing and mixing. Yeah. You know, I, I just kind of, um, I just try to serve the song, you know, um, I don't have like a one size fits all kind of mixing approach. So, you know, I, I hear how the song is developing and I just try to do what fits it. The album definitely yeah, we, we has a all big sound. To something different. But are you, yeah. but are you are you all writing together, or is somebody coming up with the genesis of an idea, and then everybody else is contributing to it to make a song out of it? Yeah, that's pretty much how it works. Either Alex will come up with something on guitar because he plays guitar as well and bass, and he he's, he plays everything. But uh, or Lou will come up with something, or or George, the bass player. Everybody comes up with something, and then. I'll throw my drums down and, and everybody will throw the bass down and, and keyboards and stuff like that. So everybody's adding their own ideas. There's no, there's no like, uh, I wrote this song and play it like this and that's it. Everybody is able to be free and do what they want. So that's why the songs sound the way they do, you know. One of my favorite songs on the record is with Wings and No. It's like a barn burn. I mean, almost eight minutes long. Oh, yeah. I love songs like that. You know, they kind of tell a story and you can really get a feel for it because it doesn't end before you get into it. It keeps going on. Right, right, yeah. Right. 
Yeah, uh, a friend of mine actually. He's a he's a wrestler, uh, and they, his, he's got a wrestling company, uh, Deep South Rep- Wrestling, and uh, they're actually using that song right now for their uh, one of their shows they have coming up. And uh, I also asked him because I want to make a video for that song, and I, and he put like a little clip, like a wrestling clip of all the stuff that's going to happen for that event that they're going to have, and it came out really cool looking. So I said, if you can do anything for the day of that show and have all the clips ready, and, and I can make a video with that song added to it. It's going to be really cool, so I can't wait till that comes out. It's uh, I, I love that song a lot. I think that's that's probably one of my favorites as well. It's a killer tone, it, like like you said, right? Like you said, it it kind of shows everything that we do all in one song. Yeah, it really does. I mean, what could be better than having your song played when a wrestler comes walking down? That's kind of like the ultimate thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. I love that. <laughs> well, you know, you have the songs together now. The album's recorded. You shop it around to a label. I mean, I know you some was slip trick, but I guess it didn't work out in the end. Oh yeah, we found out. Uh, nobody, if anybody listening to this is in a band, don't don't ever trust that record label slip trick. <laughs> um, <laughs> they just, you know, and and any label that asks for money, don't don't fall for it. You know, I mean, unfortunately, we did, but we it sounded like a good deal, and it wasn't. So we got our money back, but uh, yeah, if they ask for money, don't give it to them because they, they just don't. They say they're going to do this, do that, and it, everything is you can do it on your own, you know, for half of the the price that they want. So never, never, don't fall for those scams. It's true. Today, what can't you do on your own as a, as an artist that you needed a label to do? Maybe back oh. in the seventies and eighties, you can do it. All. You you get distribution, but you know yeah. what? With a little work, you could even make that happen. And let's be honest, how many people? You know, a lot of things are digital today. Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, that was yeah. one of the first things. Like Alex, really, he's 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 actually the youngest guy in the band, so he's really more into the the streaming and and the uh, you know the digital you know part of the whole thing. And uh, you know we're older guys, so you know we all want our CDs and records and all that stuff. <clears throat> but we're trying to uh, you know use the internet <laughs> more with our our music because that's what everybody uses, you know. And also too, we don't really have a a presence outside of the internet anyway right now, so. We we try to use everything we can to put our music out there. Yeah, I hear. That. I mean, Alex, what's the challenges of playing a live show today? I mean, besides getting the band together from being in multiple regions, I mean, we, you're still pretty close. You don't like it that far apart, but it's still a little bit of a challenge. But what's the hardest thing about getting the shows lined up today? Is it the lack of clubs out there or being able to get a show booked? Yeah, it's it's multifold. I mean, yeah, as you said, there's, there's certainly less clubs now than there were 10 years ago, at least for New York. I can't really comment elsewhere, but I assume it's the same. Um, so yeah, less venues means less shows. Uh, venues generally pay less than they did even five years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hate to always bring up the pandemic, but you know, ever since then, the, the venues are trying to, you know, take as much money from the bands as they can, even more than they did before, uh, probably to try and make up for some lost time. And uh, so they're even trying to take merch money and everything. I mean, you know, first bands lost the, the record money, you know, then they lost the ticket sales. Now they're going to lose the merch too. What's left? That's true. How does a band go on? I mean, you know, if you're if you're a local <laughs> band just trying to have fun and get the name out there and, you know, make music when you can and it's not your life's blood or how you earn a living, I mean, how do the bands do it or how are they going to do it? Like, you have bands like Megadeth. They're not Madison Square Garden bands, but they play big shows. I mean, but how often can you come around and play? I remember at one point Megadeth was coming around every four or five months playing. And after you say, well, I just saw them five months ago. Why am I going to spend $100 on a ticket to go again? I mean, where is the future of music? I have no idea. I wish I had the answer to that. <laughs> we can't even figure it out ourselves right now. I, I don't know. It's, it's let's, so strange. Let's ask like the AI what it thinks. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Let me ask it right now. Let me see what the answer is. <laughs> Chat GPT. AI is the next thing, so I mean, it's got to start watching yeah. out for that too. I mean, it's, it's a crazy world oh, we yeah. live in, but yeah. I say, like, you know, when when Iron Maiden are done and when Metallica are done, who's coming up from the minor leagues to the big leagues? There's no chance. I don't, I don't oh, see any God. metal bands. I mean, pop bands will always be out there, rap bands, but I mean, even rock bands. I mean, like real traditional hard rock bands like ACDC. I mean, where are those next bands right. coming from? I don't see anybody waiting in the wings right now. I don't know either. It's it's like I mean, like we mentioned before. I have my podcast, and I do have a lot of great bands on there. But we're everybody's still indie, and and everybody's still trying to make their you know get their name out there and everything. And it's just really hard to see who's going to really be 
the, the standout band. I mean, you got like Greta Van Fleet, where I, I love that band, but a lot of people don't. Uh, but I, I still don't see them being like the next big thing, you know. And and I love the band Ghost, and everybody makes a big deal about them. But I went to a show and it was like half full, you know. This, there was empty seats there, so even they're not as big as they're made out to be. So I have no idea. I, I don't know what's going to go on. Uh, like Greta, Greta Van Fleet, everybody was promoting them as the next big thing. And I don't know if it was like the Led Zeppelin thing where, you know, everybody says, oh, they're right. imitating Led Zeppelin. But they are a good rock band. They are a good young rock band. And they, they should they get that shot. Yeah. And, you know, you, I don't know. Who knows? It's, it's just a crazy world we live in right now. But getting back to Seven Angel, do you have anything planned for this year as far as live shows go? Or is it not even on the books right now? <laughs> it's not even on the books, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I hear that, but you are working on new music, and you do have enough tunes. And I mean, where is the new music going? Is it kind of picking up where this album left off, or are you taking things in a little different direction musically? Uh, it's a whole different direction, I, I think, right, Alex? I'd say it's like half and half. Like, I think we kind of pick up where the album left off, because the first album, not everyone knows, but the, the track order is actually the order in which we wrote the songs. Um, so you can kind of hear maybe the progression of our writing going through it. Um, so I, like, I think the, the latter half of the first CD kind of starts getting a bit heavier, more heavy metal. And um, so we kind of pick up there and uh, keep going. I, I think the second album is, is a fair deal heavier on some tracks, um, but we still retain our like uh, sort of dynamic genre approach. We still have songs that go in other directions too yeah i think it gets a little bit more progressive too though well that's always it gets good. A little more first album. Yeah. yeah is it important to maintain a certain identity with the music because you know acdc and i may not give you the same record time and time again you know what you're going to get as soon as you hear this record coming out mm. they have other bands that really like yeah. like lizzie borden who kind of goes on these tangents from album now <laughs> over the last 20 years and you don't know if you're going to get you know the the american metal right. lizzie borden or you're going to get you know <laughs> which lizzie borden you're going to right, get so right. Is it important for the fans or the people that you're trying to win over to keep your music consistent, or do you say, "Hey, we'll do what we want to do, and if you like it, you know, come along with us"? Yeah, I, I'm always Second for thing. change. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, I, I, but I like to, I like to have things that change. I, I don't like to stay the same a lot. Like you'll see on like our next album, there is a little bit of a, a development, and then the third album there's more development. So I like gradual change. I don't like to just shock bands and all of a sudden we're like a, you know, a synth band, you know, a synth pop band or something. Right. So to, to add those elements as you're going on, and then you know it's not such a huge shock. But like like you mentioned with the Lizzie Borden thing, like that's a huge shock. Appointment to, uh, with Death was like the the album that got me into them, and that was a really good album. It's a, that's a thin uh, a Lizzie Borden album, sounding album. But now what he's doing, it's like that's like uh, uh, Rob Zombie. You know, it's like that that doesn't work. And and I don't if that ever happens with us, I don't know. But I, if we ever do, it we will gradually get there. We just won't be like this is what we do now. You know. No, I understand. You right. say it's a gradual change, but is it a forced change? Is it something that you intentionally want to do? Or is it just, you know, it's just the growth of the band and you guys as musicians working together? Yeah, I think it's just the growth. Every time we, we write a new song, it's like, where the heck did that come from? You know, we always have some kind of, like I said, uh, every every one of us listens to something different. We all listen to different genres of, of rock and metal, even some other genres as well. So sometimes somebody will just come up with this thing, and it's just like, how did we get to this? You know, it just it just happens. You know, it's it's never a conscious thing. It's never like we're gonna make this type of song. It's it's just always just happens that way. Yeah, and everybody's involved with the songwriting, like you said early on. What about the newest songs? Has everybody got their hand in it? Oh yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, everybody, everybody still does everything. That, that's how this band is. Everything is is fifty fifty with everybody in this band. So now, you know, with the new music coming out, are you going to look to shop this around again? Or are you going to just do it on your own because lessons learned, or is there still a chance out there that you might want to have a label get involved? <laughs> um, I think maybe lessons is learned. I mean, we'll still try to shop around things here and there, but I think from now on, we're kind of just do everything ourselves. You know, there's a uh, Bandcamp um, that we sell our stuff on there, uh, SeveredAngel.Bandcamp.com. And like I said, with the streaming as well, so everybody can hear the streaming, uh, all, our, all our music on streaming on all the Spotify and iTunes and everything. So I think we're just probably just going to handle it ourselves unless something comes around. Somebody wants us on their label and they're legit. So we'll see what happens, you know. I don't see why they wanted the album. is so great. And, you know, you guys did such a phenomenal job on it that, you know, people should hear this record. 
I know the internet today is, you know, pretty much the only way bands or anybody kind of has to promote anything. You're kind of locked into Facebook and Twitter and all the Instagram and all these other places okay. like that. But, you know, back in the day, you used to put up flies on a telephone pole. Nobody knew who you were. They see the fly, they come see the band. <laughs> it was such a simple way of doing things. And like Alex was saying before, like with the clubs now, they want a cut of your merchandise when you're selling in the club. They yeah. want everything, you know. And I remember a few years ago, bands were bitching when they had to, like, buy 10 tickets and try to sell them before the show started. They're their friends. I think they'd oh, want to yeah. go back to that today, you know. Compared to the way things oh, are going, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it's yeah. a much harder time right now. I mean, and it's unbelievable. Like, I only heard about that merchandise thing about a year ago for the first time, and I've been involved in this mm. music scene and business for forty something years. I didn't know clubs were actually starting to take a cut of the band's merchandise at that table. Oh yeah, yeah I went to new. Merciful Fate. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I went to Merciful Fate last uh, November uh, when they came here to Brooklyn. And uh, their shirts were like forty, forty-five dollars. I'm like, why are they forty, forty-five dollars? And I found out, and I'm like, well, I'm not buying, buying a shirt. You know, they're like thirty bucks online, so I might as well just buy it online. That's crazy, yeah. Because the club has got to get a cut of it, and that's a big place, the King's Theater, right. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was actually, it was a sold-out show, but uh, <laughs> that, that whole thing is insane, man. It's just, and, and it's gonna, and if if bands stop selling their stuff merch at shows, then the venues are gonna want to take it out of something else. You know, so the bands are kind of like left in like a, a bad spot, you know. I know it's hard for everybody, but forty five dollars for a t shirt is just insane. You buy them from you buy yeah. the same shirt made in China. They got four ten year olds working on it, put them together overnight, and you get it for like three dollars <laughs> in the mail shift. It takes like nine months to get the shirt, but you'll get it. Uh, you'll get it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it'll it'll come in the mail. Uh, but you know what? Hey guys, I'm gonna cut you loose in a few minutes. I want to play a couple of songs. I got another guest coming on behind you. Uh, but where's the best place for people to find out what you guys are up to and what you're doing, and and what's going on with the with Rat Salad Review? Anything coming up this week? Um, not this week, but in a few weeks we have um, uh, what the heck is her name? Lori Kay. She actually wrote a book about uh, her last interview with John Lennon, which was the with the one right before he got killed. Wow. And uh, yeah, I got I got to go through the book yet, but um, she was on another podcast that I listened to, and and it sounds like it's going to be a really very interesting interview. So it's going to be really cool. That'd be uh, September sixth, actually. So that's what we have coming up for that. And uh, if anybody wants to see uh, the Severed Angel band, just look up Severed Angel on Facebook or Instagram, or SeveredAngel.com. Everything is on there, or SeveredAngel.bandcamp.com. Everything is uh, for sale on that as well. That's fantastic. At least you have two weeks to read the book. I love it when they say, I want to step into you this weekend. It has a 900-page book. Oh, yeah. Go through it in two days and let me know. <laughs> it takes you two days just to turn the first page open. <laughs> I know, right? It's uh, crazy, but hopefully I can get to it. I, I'm, I'm sure, sure you some will. of the other podcasts, so I know, I know most of it already, so <laughs> I'll right. be fine. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, Wayne, Alex, it was a pleasure having you on there today. I want to get on a couple of songs off the record. And uh, mm-hmm. listen, next time the record comes out, come on. We'll do this all over again, and we'll have a good time with it. Very Absolutely. good. Awesome. Thank you very much. For having Take care, fun. guys. Have a great night. All right. Bye you bye. Too. Bye. All right. Let's get us some songs off the record. How about, you know what? Ooh. I want to do the song I was just talking about, but that's like almost eight minutes long. So let's do Dogs of War first. <laughs>
Great is that Seven Angel with Wings Anew? I want to thank Wayne and Alex for being on tonight's show. We're going to get to John Gallagher in about 10 minutes, not even. I'm going to play one song by Silver Mountain. This is a song called 1789. Everybody thought Yingve Malmsteen was in this band for some reason back in the day, but he had nothing to do with them at all. They were a pretty good band in the early days. You know, the Shaking Brains record was pretty cool. Uh, we'll do that, then we'll line up some classic Raven, and we'll talk to John right after that. So here you go Silver Mountain, 1789. <laughs> Yeah. 
I can't figure out this technology. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what no, I'm doing. The, I clicked on the Zoom link and it says the meeting is scheduled for Wednesday. And I'm like, oh, that must have been the original. Oh, and yeah. And I went to the old email because, you know, I ended up going down to London yesterday. So that's originally, I think, when this stuff was going to be done, Wednesday or Thursday. But uh, obviously that doesn't work. If this works for you, then that's great. Yeah, that's fine. We can record it like this. And I'm glad that I got you because, like I said, I can't figure out technology. I'm a telephone person, <laughs> pen and paper. <laughs> but but it, <laughs> it's great that you can figure it out because I can't. But, hey, listen, what an amazing job on this new record, All Hell's Breaking Loose. I mean, Raven have never disappointed. That's pretty impressive for a going on almost 50-year career. I appreciate that, man. Uh, we're obviously very happy with it. It's exactly what we set out to do you know we had a mandate we had a great record last round uh, with metal city and we knew we had to raise the bar and it was just like well let's just go balls out here 10 songs 35 40 minutes all killer no filler go for the lungs and that's uh, really what we went for we wrote a lot of songs and we were able to cherry pick you know what would be a great opener you know, what, what What would be very cool for an end song. Uh, and, you know, we had a, a pretty wide variety of stuff, but we just kind of gravitated to the, uh, you know, the chainsaw to the back of the head type of thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, you did that. You know, people will always say, like, you know, how do you do this? Like, album after album, like, all these decades, come up with new music, good music, you know, on top of that. And then isn't part of a sort of repetition, like, you know, when you're a stonemason and you're carving stone all day, you know what you're doing. So when it comes to writing music, it, but there's an art form to it also. It's just not being repetitive in what you're writing, but you, there's an artistic value to it. It has to be good, different, and original every time. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the two parts of that. You can split it in half. There's the creative part where, obviously, you, you don't want to repeat yourself. And then there's the craft part, which is the... You know, it's it's like the creative part's drawn the blueprints, and then the craft part is just, you know, you know how to lay the bricks. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that is true. So you call that, but, but at the same time, that's, that has to be done in a creative manner, so it doesn't sound like it's three guys, uh, you know, reading music and just uh, plonking it down soullessly. It, it has to have that uh, energy and passion, uh, which... You know, we've gotten spades, so that's a, you know that's that's never an issue, and we just push each other. I mean, this record was really done all in house. It was the three of us from the get go. You know, Mike in at the ground floor this time, Mike Haller, our drummer. So he contributed riff ideas and song ideas, and you know, we all chewed over the lyrics and we all chewed over throwing riffs around at each other with the arrangements, and then. You know, we critiqued Mike doing the drums and, you know, Mike and Mark critiqued me doing the bass and doing the vocals and we critiqued Mark doing the guitars and, you know, we, we produced each other and Mike did a phenomenal job engineering and recording all the music and we had one outside guy, this guy Lassie Lammert, who's like a phenomenal German guy who did a killer mix and it worked worked great you know it really did you know when you talk about having to kind of critique each other's contributions to the songs or the album I mean you would think after so many decades especially you and your brother you know playing together since the beginning of the band you would kind of know what each other wants or expects from each other musically in that contribution but I guess you still do kind of have to say hey let's you know do this or do that to get it to the final point of where it should be 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you, each of us has to be open uh, because that's that's how you make something better. Uh, you know, you can take it so far, but someone on the outside like that can look and go, I know you can do better, or that's okay, can we try something else? You know? Sure. Or you're very close, just that one phrase there. And, yeah, I mean, it might turn into a, an argument, a discussion of, like, well, I don't agree, I think that's great. And, and so, well, try it. And then you try it, and then you A, B, and you pick the best, you know? You, you go through those things. True. But, uh, 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 are the arguments today more subtle and controlled than when you were 20 years old and you had disagreements? Uh, not really. They're just about the same. We were never the type of guys that would be throwing chairs at each other. Uh, the only time I, I can remember, it, it, there was a few times things got heated in the studio. Uh, I remember throwing a bass at Joe Hasselvander once. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember Mark thro- almost throwing a guitar at Michael Wagner once, uh, <laughs> but that was that was for on and on. It's got a lot of what's called suspended chords, you know, like the chords on a what's the pinball wizard? Da, yeah, da, yeah. It's da 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 da, and he was playing his old Telecaster, and it, it doesn't have great intonation. And, of course, when you're in the studio, it's like the microscope, you know. Any failure of your instrument is going to be magnified. And could he help play this thing in tune? And he was trying to cheat by bending. And Michael got so mad. (laughs) And Mark got so mad. So they basically screamed at each other, walked out. Give it half an hour, came back and made it happen, you know? <laughs> yeah. Very time. You know, John, I, I mean, I've seen Raven being here in New York. I'm lucky because, you know, every band kind of comes through New York and I've been able to see you guys dozens and dozens of times live. The first time is at that Halloween Headbangers Ball in Staten Island, where I live now, uh, with oh, wow. Anvil and Very Riot. Cool. So I, I go that far back. And I think back to those early days of the band. If, I, if I'm if i correct, I think Neat Records, when they released their first record, was. Raven was the first actual real release under the Neat label, and you were with them for many it was years their back first then. Album. Their yeah, first album, because I remember they used album. to send it to MCA they, or they another label. Had a couple of singles before they had the Tigers of Pantang had the single, and then Fist had a single. Then we had a single, but we had the first album out on there, yeah. Yeah, and you know, for those couple of years you were with Neat, and you know, a young label, a new label, just like everybody else was in the scene at that time. This was all kind of new late 70s, early 80s, but, you know, you came to America for that show, and I think it was Johnny Z from Megaforce who kind of brought you over here, and this was, I think in the days when Megaforce was really even like Megaforce itself, John just had the flea market, you know, record store, I think, at the time. Uh, Did you think that that was your opening and your opportunity to kind of break in America by having that kind of contact, or when you got here to say, wow, this man has a flea market, it's not what I thought it was going to be? Uh, well, of course, that was, you know, the, here's a guy that's got the biggest import record store on the eastern seaboard. You don't expect to see, a, you know, a small shop in a flea market. However, he was, you know, bringing in a ton of imports and selling them. Um, that was the place to go. The, the, you know, kids were like lining up to, to buy this stuff. And we just knew he had he had vision. From the get-go, he had vision, he had balls to bring us over. And we did that, and we did like four shows, I think, with Anvil, right after that one. Yeah. Around the tri-state area. And then it was like, well, let's do it bigger and better next year. Let's do a headline tour. And again, that's what happened. And he said, oh, I've got this great band, of, you know, the biggest band in San Francisco to open for you. And we're like... Nah, you know, because who's the list of big bands in San Francisco? I mean, yeah. Jefferson Starship, Sammy <laughs> Hagar, Junior, you know, it goes on and on and on. And it's like, no, Metallica. And we're like, who? Never heard of them. And then yeah. a tape came in the mail over there, and it was No Life to Leather. And put it on, and it was like, oh, these guys sound like, you know, Motorhead on crack. And that'll be perfect. Okay, let's go with that. <laughs> yep. And, and, and that was our it, introduction to Metallica, right? Yeah, and it worked out. And a few, I think it was maybe two years later when you, Metallica, and Anthrax played at the Rosalind Ballroom. That's when all you guys got signed. 
when you look back, I mean, that day has to be like one of the happiest days we see. You know, we, we, we started a band. You know, when when an underground scene, we never know if it's going to take off, be big, if it's going to be the next thing, if major label. And then all three of you get signed to a major label. You couldn't have been more happy that night when it happened. But as time goes on, do you say to yourself, you know, what happened here? I beg to differ. That was a, a, a very traumatic night. Really? The, the gig was good. But yeah, we had all our significant others over from England saying they were breaking up with us. Ah. All at once. Wow. All three of them. And that was like, oh, really? Nice nice time to tell us. And then some idiot jumped on stage when the lights went down and tried to steal Mark's, that Telecaster guitar. Yeah, that was me. No, I'm just and joking got, around. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy got as far as the door, but... Uh, when we heard that, that was like the final straw. I went ape shit and tried to, I basically tore a door off its hinges. Uh, horrifying Scott Ian in the process. And, and of course, we, our blood was up. We were mad and we went out to kill and we did. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. You know, you would never think that you figured what a great night it was that you know, all three bands on top of that would get signed and yourself included to Atlantic which was a humongous label back then. But when you get to Atlantic, I know, you know, I, I remember you read an interview this where you're saying like, you know, they want to change it. They want you to be like, you know, Motorhead and Bon Jovi together or something like that. And did you realize then that, hey, maybe this wasn't, you know, what we thought it was going to be? Uh, that really didn't sink in until the whole pack is back thing. And then it was like, what's going on here? Well, you know, the, the, the label want this, the label want that. And then after we, you know, agreed to put the red nose on and the clown shoes and did all that, and then they were like, well, we're not going to give you money to do a video, which, hey, maybe that was for the best. I don't know. But uh, we just turned around and said, no, done, no more. We're not doing this. Uh, If we sink without a trace, we're going to do it with some form of integrity. So, you know, we had an opportunity to open for Twisted Sister on their Come Out and Play Out uh, tour. So we did an EP. And then I think, like, it was literally maybe two, three days before the tour started, they blew off the whole tour. So we just put the EP out and went out and headlined, you know. There's a lot of weird situations. We were with a, a great agent, but the agent couldn't get us to play with any metal bands because all the other metal bands were on a different agency and that agency were pissed off at us because we hadn't signed with them yeah yeah and it got to the point that we had to leave premier talents and sign up with uh what were they it's something like mci i can't even remember now and you know that was the last tour we did with rob which was the the wasp slayer thing, you know. Yeah, I, you know, it seems like it's the same story for so many bands that the business aspect of the music business is what kills the music part of it. Oh yeah, I mean it's uh, it, it, well, you know, we're not businessmen. I mean, we've we're we're businessmen uh, uh, as a default because you kind of have to be eventually, you know. Yeah, you, if you're not going to take care of it, I'll look after it. I'll watch out for yourself you're just going to get taken advantage of. And, you know, that's kind of what happened to us. But we we, did, we didn't give up. So many people give up. And we were lucky that some of our business deals that would have killed us weren't structured, so we were personally liable. At least we were smart enough for that. It was done under a corporation. So if there was huge amounts of money owed, right, I'll tell you a good one. Uh, we owed a publishing company an awful lot of money. And they kept asking, you know, all of the time after, like, Rob left and all this for a few years, they kept asking, when are you guys doing a new record? Oh, yeah, sure, uh-huh, I'll let you know. And, of course, we never let them know. We were just putting records out. And we have a song on the Stay Hard album called When the Going Gets Tough. And kept saying that uh, we kept making all this money and the amount of money we owed them, like, halved. You know, it went down to, like, 20 grand or something. And it kept going down. 
And then all of a sudden I get a message saying, we're really sorry, we've been accidentally giving you the royalties from Billy Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that was short-lived. <laughs> That's pretty good. You know, Billy Ocean has some big hits back in the day, so <laughs> hopefully you got you landed on one of the big ones. Yeah. I'm That's... Just, it'd be funny if Billy Ocean got uh, called to do something in the metal world. That would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> it would be. We, we did get asked. We did get asked uh, quite a few years ago. It was uh, it was F A O Schwartz, you know the famous yeah. toy store in New York, and they got in touch and they said they had this big promotion they wanted to do and they wanted us to play and they wanted this and they wanted that and it clicked when I got halfway through the email. I said, I think you want the girl called Raven. You're not looking for the band, <laughs> are you? <laughs> A little bit of confusion there. Even Simone. Yeah, oh, you go. God. But, you know, John, with all the shows that I've seen you guys play over the decades, I mean, you go out there like you have nothing to lose, like it's your first show and you're trying to take over the world. Nothing has changed since the beginning. I mean, how do you keep up that energy after all this time when you go out there? It's like, you know, we got to win this crowd over type of thing, even though, you know, you're the stars of the show. Well, it's a, you know, it's a boxing fight. It's a wrestling fight. It's war. It's, uh, you know, this is what we do. We, we go out and it's, uh, you know, no holds barred, 100%. That That's the way we've always done it. Every show has to be the best show you've done because it might be the last show you do. You know, nothing in life is certain other than we're going to go out there and give it everything we got. And we love to do that. And being now is, I mean, geez, this is our 49th year. It'll be our 50th year next year. Uh, we have that reputation. We have that legacy. So we're certainly not going to stop now. <laughs> I'm glad for that. Well, you know, the last couple of years you've got out there with 40th anniversary shows for Wiped Out and All for One. Uh, I think about a year and a half from now, it'll be Stay Hard's turn. You're planning on doing the same thing for each album, getting out there, and, you know, and just giving everybody a show based on that album? I don't know. I, you know, it, it was weird. We, we had fun doing it, but I, I would hate to be locked into that because, you know, we were putting out albums like every year, every two years. It would mean we'd be locked into doing that every year. And it's like, oh, I don't know. Next year's going to be interesting because it'll still be part of this album, obviously. Yeah. And then it's the 50th, so we'll probably be playing you know, a mixture of new stuff and then pulling a few old songs that we've never done or have rarely done, you know. Like, I get people saying, when are you guys going to do something off Life's a Bitch? Well, maybe we'll do that, you know, something like that. Or Architect of Fear or something like that. Pull a couple of uh, songs out of left field and that'll be that'll be interesting. We'll do that. And make it more of a celebration of the band, you know, the 50-year thing, you know. That would be great. Because, uh, you know, we've done the Wiped Out, we did All For One. I don't want to be locked into like, okay, it's, uh, you know, 2024, you're going to do Live at the Inferno, then 25, you're going to do yeah, Stay yeah. Hard, and 26, you know what I mean? It, 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 that would well, go on for about the next five or six years. <laughs> sure. I, I get it. You, know, you have such a large catalog, such a diverse catalog. It's got to be difficult just to, during a regular show to get a little bit of everything on. That's impossible. You know the fans want to hear the bigger hits from the early days of the band that kind of broke the band in. You got those great songs, like you said, off of Architect of Fear and Life's a Bitch and Nothing Exceeds Like Success. You know, So you want to kind of like give a little bit of everything to everybody, but it's hard. Yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, you, you, you know, you're, you're restricted. I mean... This kind of music, it's it's not like a Pink Floyd show or even a Led Zeppelin show where you're gonna, you know, where they would, all right, we're gonna spend, you know, 30, 40 minutes doing an acoustic set in the middle, where they could, you know, stretch it out. And there's, you know, what we're doing is uh, kill, 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 pretty much. So, you know, like an hour twenty, an hour thirty, works. I mean, we've had shows where we've played two hours and, you know, the audience is dead on the floor. It's, you know, it doesn't it doesn't do anyone no favours. Of course, usually an audience that wants that much are absolutely insane anyway. So that's all right by me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's... Uh, it, it's like it's like the album thing. You know, you, you can put 80 minutes of music or 
you know, 85 minutes of music on a CD, but why would you do that? Unless you've got a, a narrative, you know, like a concept album where you're going to tell a long story and you need that much real estate to tell the story. That's why we said, you know, with Metal City and with this one, it's like, no. Think back to Van Halen 1. Think back to the Montreux's first album. You know? All killer, no filler. Boom, boom, boom. Absolutely. I mean, over the years, Raven have had their lengthy songs that, you know, tell a big story, I think, on their own. Uh, but sometimes, you know, those four or five minute ones where you just hit people with a good chorus and verse, that's all you need. And you've done that on this new record. Yeah, and I mean, it, and it doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be forever. I mean, some of the songs we we wrote, uh, which actually we recorded more than we needed, uh, and who knows whether we'll keep those or, you know, redo them or what have you, but there was one song in particular that's quite long and a little dark, almost bluesy, uh, and a bit of a departure. And uh, that's cool. It just didn't work on this album. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just didn't work. That happens. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, you know, maybe an EP, or maybe we'll say, well, maybe we'll keep that back. I mean, the one song that was a holdout from Metal City was Surf the Tsunami. We had that pretty much as is back then, and we were just like, I don't know. This sounds, you know, it's, it's really, really good. And we just said, well, we put it to one side and we came up with the album with all the other songs who said, ah, let's think about that for the next one. And it fits on this perfectly. So It does. I, I mean, do you have that one song or that one riff that you've had in your head or on a tape somewhere for 40 or 50 years that you still haven't been able to figure out how to make work in a song? Yeah, that's, I've definitely got riffs like that. I mean, there's a riff for Marx from... I've been trying to make it work forever since 1983 and I finally wrote the song and it was in the bunch of songs for this and for whatever reason didn't make the cut. Great song. It's a real raven riff, you know, like along the lines of a Hell Patrol type of riff or something like that. Uh, it's a very melodic, it's, you know, hard and heavy but it's very melodic and um, you know, that's probably just needs a little bit of a, uh, you know, tuck and tail, a little yeah. bit of trimming, and, and who knows. But uh, it, I've, I've got a pretty good memory for a lot of that stuff. But I, I don't make a habit of trawling through the box of tapes to, you know, let's see what, what we missed on that. Uh, and going through tapes for when I did the Rock Until You Drop box set, You'll be all these unmarked tapes, and it'll be surprising. You'll find a riff, uh, like one or two of the riffs from uh, what was it, Top of the Mountain, floating around years and years and years ago. And it, it was, you know, just like you know, four or five seconds worth. Ah, ah, that's where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> and it, Sometimes it's just like subconscious, you know. It's like you 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 found out you'd actually played something like that once upon a time. Yeah, I was gonna but, say uh, that. Did you ever write? You ever start playing something and say this is great? And then your brother says, you know, we kind of did that and wiped out. <laughs> you just don't remember. Oh, that I mean, yeah, once or twice it'll be like, oh, you've done that before. And I th I think we actually did it once. There was a uh, one song where we used a riff for a for under a, under a solo. And it was drastically similar to another song, but I don't think anybody caught it. So <laughs> by the time we realized it was too late. So it's, it's tough, you know, it's tough to keep up with that. And you want to try and keep as original as possible. And the only way you could really do that is to listen to everyone else. And you can't do that because there's, there's too many bands, there's too much music. So you really just got to plow ahead and do it your way. And luckily we... we you know, got our own bastardized original, for want of a better word, sound. Uh, so what we do usually comes out sounding like us, and that's a good thing. You know? Absolutely. That's what makes Raven Raven. But, John, if you look back to your first single, you know, Don't Need Your Money, up to the new record, All Hell's Breaking Loose, 
do you look at Raven's career as one continuation of album after album, or do you look back on it and say, you know, there were chapters to this band. There was, you know, the early chapter, the mid chapter, you know, the one we're in now. How do you look at like the whole span of almost a fifty year career of Raven? Yeah, you, you kind of got to look at it in, in chapters. You know, there was the the initial six years of being a four piece, learning our trade, playing the working men's clubs in the northeast of England, uh, playing the pubs, learning how to, you know, hook an audience, entertain them, get across, get them to be on your side, get the, you know, transfer that energy out and get it back off them. And then when Rob joined, so the whole Neat Records thing, and then the Atlantic thing, and then, you know, Joe Hasselbander coming in, and the whole, you know, the the tough years of dealing with grunge and all the rest of it, and then, you know, fighting back through that, and then Mark having his accident in 2001, and then coming back from that, and then really... You know, pushing all the way through till, you know, Joe left because of his, you know, heart problems. And then getting Mike in, which was the start of a whole new chapter on that, you know. True. You know, when you think about it, you know, three lineup changes over the years. Outside, not talking not talking about the original era of the band in the demo stage and before the first record came out. But three drummers over a, a, a span of 40 years is incredible to begin with. And it's hard to say Mike is kind of the new guy now because he has about five, maybe six years in the band as it stands right now. But when you, when you think yeah, about like the day, yeah, when you think about the days with you know with, with Wacko on drums and then with Joe, I mean they were just incredible times. And people, I don't know if people heard this story, but there was something I heard that early on in the band, you know, you were offered to go out with Ozzy on tour, which is something I didn't even know about until like a year or two ago. And that you were, there was a chance that you were going to actually sign with Sharon or with I guess Jet Wreckage back then or with Don. I don't, I don't remember the whole thing I heard, but was that was there something to that? Yeah, I mean, what happened is. Uh... Our first single, Don't Need Your Money, was out on, you know, on Neat. And there was a guy called John Peel, who was a very influential DJ on BBC Radio 1. And he had a show, and the concept of the show was he'd play new music. Didn't matter what it was. So he's the guy that played all the punk stuff, because it was all new music, right? So we have a single, saying, oh, I've got this new single. Neat Records, band called Raven. Check it out. And he'd play it. Boom. And Ozzy heard it. And Ozzy went, I love that. I want that band. So we went out and played four dates on the Blizzard of Oz tour in 1980. We played uh, Newcastle Mayfair, Sunderland Mayfair, Middlesbrough Town Hall, and Hammersmith Odeon. And by the time we got to Hammersmith Odeon, I was sitting at a table at the back of the hall with Sharon and Ozzy. And Sharon goes, Ozzy wants a hand in your future. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Okay. And literally two seconds after that, there's all this commotion. And this guy bursts into the through the doors at the back in a white suit with a white hat, looking like the godfather. <laughs> and that was that was uh, her father, Don Arden. And he started cursing and screaming at them, and they all got up and got into a fight. And I just like extricated myself from the situation, walked away, and that was the last we ever heard of any of that. Oh wow, <laughs> that's amazing! Well, you know, people. That, I mean, Ozzy is Ozzy. I mean, Ozzy was you know the singer of Black Sabbath. So Ozzy was already famous at the time, but he didn't really hit that plateau that he did after the Blizzard of Oz took off, and you know what happened years later on. And Sharon. Really, nobody knew who Sharon was outside of the business back then, you know? And look what happened all these years later. Do you think if anything came out of that, things would have been different today? Uh, yeah, and probably not for the better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, let, let's let's face it. Sharon's a very effective manager, but she's a very effective manager for one client. Yes. You know? And she's proved that <laughs> many times. Many times over, because, you know, they, they've managed or have been involved with that with many other acts but uh, only one really works you know so now that's definitely a what if that I, I wouldn't pursue <laughs> <laughs> 
I, you know, because you, you look at things now, you say, man, wow, what would have happened? But, you know, for people that know the scene of what was going on, yeah, that probably would have been a big mistake back then. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I, I really don't play the what if thing. I mean, obviously, the one I get asked the most to say, oh, you know, Metallica is the biggest band in the world, blah, blah, blah. Do you feel jealous or do you feel that should have been you or did, did you realize that they and all that stuff? And, you know, stuff happens. Yeah, shit happens, as they say, you know. Uh, you do your best you can and, you know, you'll you'll make good decisions and you'll make bad decisions and hopefully you'll learn from the bad ones and try to move forward. And I just think we're incredibly lucky, incredibly humbled and blessed to be able to do what we do, do it as well as we do, and to still be doing it, you know. So I've got... Absolutely no regrets whatsoever. And where, there shouldn't be. You know, where we, I, I mean, like yesterday, I was invited to go down to London to jam with the band Alcatraz. And, uh, you know, Kim from Girls' School got up and we did a couple of songs at the end. That's great. That's, you know, awesome. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's all it's all good, and there's uh, there's more to come. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, wealth wealth comes in a lot of different forms. It doesn't always have to be money. I mean, we'd all prefer it to be money, <laughs> I guess, you know, because it makes life a lot easier. But the influence that you, your brother, and every other drum that's been in the band had have on this scene, I think, is more important than anything else. You guys were originators. You were one of the most original bands that came out back then, and you still are today. I mean, the influence that you've peddled on thousands of kids and other bands that started and came up after you. I think it has to, you know, put a little bright spot in your eye at the end of the day. Oh, that's, you know, incalculable. You, you cannot put a price on that, you know, because, you know, like like the majority of bands are out there, we're huge fans. We know what it means, you know, when, when we've met our heroes and, you know, people treat you right and it, it's very inspiring and to to think that we've inspired anyone is uh you know it, it's it's very meaningful it's it's very humbling and it's it gives you a responsibility to continue to do your best and keep pushing you know absolutely John, I'm not going to keep it. I know it's in London. You're getting, it's getting late over there. You're about five or six hours ahead of us over there. But you're out there doing a whole bunch of shows right now. I know you have more lined up festivals. Are you looking to get back to the U.S. and do tours over here? Is anything lined up or stuff that's going to be working off for maybe next year? We will be announcing very, very soon. Oh, we'll fantastic. We'll be touring the States in October and November. Oh, that's fantastic. This will be time number 25, I think. So I can't wait to see you again, John. It's always a blast out there on the road with you guys. It makes you feel like I'm a 16-year-old kid again, standing in front of the stage in St. George and Staten Island. That's what it's all about, man. The music keeps us all young. That's it. You keep it going, John. I can't wait for the next record to come out so we can do this again, and then it'll be over 50 years. <laughs> Absolutely, mate. All right. Have a great night, my friend. Take care. We'll talk soon. You bet. Take Bye -bye. care, man. Bye.
Raven, The Far Side. I think we played every song off this record over the last couple of months. It's definitely in the top 10 this year, and it's not going anywhere. John's a great guy. We had so many problems trying to make this interview happen this week. It was scheduled by the record label. It was supposed to take place on Zoom. I've never used Zoom before. I cannot figure it out for the life of me. I thought we had it nailed down. Then the interview's got to change and reschedule for a different date. None of those Zoom links worked. I don't know how I don't know how to do use Zoom. I just don't know how to use it. I'm not a technology guy. Ninety percent interviews we do are over the phone and then there are no those that we do over Skype, which are easier. And after it bombed out, I said, Let me just reach out to John again on Skype and we got him and we made it work out. So it really was a last minute thing that it happened. Ah, all right, we're gonna play one or two more songs. We're gonna wrap it up here tonight. I want to thank the guys from Seven Angel and John Gallagher of Raven for being on here tonight. No show next weekend. We're taking the Labor Day weekend off to recuperate. Plus, my son-in-law and I have to start going through our Halloween decorations and start building some of our larger props. We put on a humongous display here where we live in Staten Island. So, uh, we got to get that going next weekend. But we're back the week after that, the 10th of September. It's our 15-year anniversary show. Udo Dirk Schneider will be on the show that night. Adrian Vandenberg is on the show that night, and I think we might have Phil Campbell of Motorhead also. He's got Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons taking place right now, so I'm not sure about Phil yet. I'll find out this week when we confirm things with his rep, but it's looking like a great 15-year show. So how about we do, you know, Bernie Madsen from White Snake Dot. I was going to get us some Alaska tonight. Uh, we just don't have the time. We're down to less than 10 minutes. If I can, I'll try to squeeze it on. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen. Christian wanted to hear Force 3. They were a Christian band out of the United Kingdom, mid to late 80s. Uh, they only had the one record out before they kind of disappeared in a demo in 1987. Let me get the song for Christian. It's called Warrior of Light. And then we'll wrap it up with one final song. Warrior of Light, destroy the force of darkness. Warrior of Light, destroy, destroy.
All right, Force 3, Warriors of Life, some angelical Christian music there for you. Pretty good band from back in the day. I wish more would have came out of them. All right, let's wrap it up here tonight. How about we do something that kind of combines this week's guest with our next guest coming up in two weeks. Here's Raven and Udo doing Born to be Wild. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. If you're here in the U.S., enjoy your Labor Day holiday next weekend. Every day is like a holiday to me since I retired five months ago. So for the people that are still working, enjoy your long weekend. We'll see you on the 10th for our 15-year anniversary show with Adrian Vandenberg, Udo Dirkschneid. I believe Sven is calling in with them, and maybe Phil Campbell. So take care, everybody. Have a great week. (laughs) 